Good afternoon. I'm Mary Hal Grant, and I'm filling in for Tim Murphy, who will be late to our meeting today. Um, I want to welcome you to the Science and Engineering Council of, of Santa Barbara's February meeting. And please note our sponsors, to whom we are thankful, Community West Bank, Bengal, Toyon, and Manal. We also want to say thank you. Nice announcement. We also would like to say thank you to those who donated to the Science and Engineering Council this month, as well as to those who have donated to the Scholarship Foundation for the Science and Engineering Council Scholarship. So we have two new and renewing mem members, Andrew Kendrick and Lisa Black. Welcome, hope you're with us today. I would ask that participants mute themselves unless uh, you're asking a question of the speaker. And we are going to be continuing to hold these meetings on Zoom until we feel it's safe to be Zoom in person. As soon as that happens, we'll try to do it. So I'd like to uh, say we have several board members with us today. If you all could raise your hands. I think uh, Yvonne DeGraw obviously is here. Uh, John Ilgen, Bob Lilly, John Fishpaw, Stephen Skopak, and as I said, Tim Murphy will be joining us later. John, would you like to say a few words about the scholarship? Yeah, yes, um, thank you. I'd like to uh, mention that the deadline for donating scholarships will be March 1st. That's March 1st, the deadline. And our local students are uh, the ones that actually get to receive these scholarships. I think that's a very important point. And the scholarships are focused on science. Additionally, I'd like to also mention that the scholarship uh, program within the Science and Engineering Council is administered by the Scholarship Foundation of Santa Barbara, which incidentally is one of the largest in the nation that deals with scholarships. And the focus is on students that really need funding. Mary, it's back to you. Okay. So the only other thing I'd like to say before I turn it over to Yvonne is that um, we're going to ask you, I think, to type your questions into the chat when, once the speaker starts, and then they will be answered at the end of the meeting. Yvonne? Great, thank you, Mary. Um, and thank you to everyone, or welcome to everyone here. Um, I wanted to announce that our next meeting will let be uh, March 9th on Zoom. Um, and we are, as Mary mentioned, uh, talking about returning to in-person luncheons at some point when it seems safe. Our March speaker will be Dr. Christopher Free, who is an assistant researcher at the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management. He'll be speaking on expanding ocean food production under climate change, which is also the title of a paper he has coming out in Nature soon. In addition, the Santa Barbara County Science Fair is coming up soon. Because of the dates of the county and state fairs, we'll be holding an additional meeting to present awards and hear from the top winning students. That meeting will be on either March 23rd or 30th on Zoom. We haven't decided on the exact date yet. The county fair will be held March 10th and 11th in UCSB's Corwin Pavilion. A number of uh, SEC members have helped to judge the competition in the past and registration for judges is now open. I was gonna show you, here's the, the webpage for the science fair. And um, if you wanna to register to be a judge, uh, here, here is the page for um, registering as a judge. Um, 
We'll host other interesting talks in future months on topics that include COVID and flu testing that uses smartphone cameras as detectors, Alzheimer's prevention and treatments, and quantum computing. So if you're on our email list, you'll get uh, uh, invitations to register for those meetings. And um, if you're a member, you get a discount. Today, we're happy to present this as a talk by, this talk by Dr. Arnab Mukherjee, He's an assistant professor of chemical engineering at UCSB, where his lab started in the summer of 2018. Prior to arriving at UCSB, he completed a Boswell Fellowship in Molecular Engineering at Caltech and obtained his PhD at UIUC. His research group has recently received awards, including an Outstanding Young Investigator Award from the NIH, a Discovery Award from the Department of Defense, the NARSED Young Investigator Award from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and a Scilog Fellow Award. He'll be speaking to, to us today about his lab's latest efforts to develop novel imaging tools by engineering biomolecules with unusual functions. And I believe he'll tell you um, what he, he likes as far as uh, questions during the talk. Go ahead, Arnab. Great, uh, thank you so much, Yvonne, and, and thanks for uh, having me. I really wish we could do this in person, but but hopefully soon enough. So, uh, yeah, feel, uh, th th this is a, a kind of like, it's, it's a it's a pretty uh, conversational presentation. So, if you have questions, feel free to ask um, during the talk. Uh, if I can see, if I can see your hands raised, uh, uh, that's perfectly fine. Otherwise, we can hold off questions till the end. It's it's totally uh, totally up to you, and it's as I said, it's uh, meant to be conversational. And uh, what I'll tell you about is some of the things that we have been doing. So we, we initially tried to start in uh, 2017. So this is right where my lab is uh, located. So this is where we tried to start in 2017. And this whole thing got pushed back because that was also the year uh, of the fires. So all the agencies and all the construction companies who were supposed to work on our labs, all of them got uh, kind of pushed back uh, due to the fires and rebuilding houses and everything due to the fires. So we ended up starting our lab, setting it up in 2018. And that's right here in Ealing's Hall, so pretty close to the uh, beach. And I'll, I'll tell you a little about what inspires us, what inspires our lab uh, scientifically, and how we try to approach the problem in a way that I think is a little different from how a lot of, uh, or, or, or some of the other people working in this field are looking at it. So to kind of give you the very brief idea, uh, imaging is an excellent way of getting to look at biological information. Most of us have been in some of these images, whether it's ultrasound or MRI and so on. The issue with imaging is the way it is done clinically is it usually gives you structural or anatomical or morphological information. And I'll explain what I mean by that as we go along. But this is an image of a patient who has glioblastoma, a very aggressive brain cancer. And you can see the tumor uh, in, an, in a magnetic resonance image right here. And this was the day the patient was um, uh, scanned. And very soon after the scan, the patient was started on immunotherapy. So a bunch of immune molecules and immune cells that are injected in the patient with the hope that the immune cells will kill or destroy the tumor. What happened surprisingly, and, and under these conditions, you expect the tumor to regress, you expect it to reduce in size. Surprisingly, what happened after two months during the follow-up scan was that the tumor seemed to grow more dense. It seemed to grow bigger in size as well, which is almost the opposite of what you would expect if the tumor was responding to therapy. Now at this point, it was possible, or it could have been the case that the clinicians uh, felt that the tumor was increasing in mass or go, the treatment should be amped up or more aggressive measures should be taken. Uh, that wasn't the case in this particular scenario. What happened during another follow-up after six months or eight months was that the tumor seemed to have shrunk back again. So basically this whole story is an example of what's called pseudo progression, which is even after treatment, normally if you treat a tumor, you expect it to shrink in size. In this case, even after treatment, the tumor actually grows in size. And the reason for that, or one of the speculated reasons for that is as the tumor is responding to treatment, it gets infiltrated by immune cells from other parts of the body, from the brain. And it is those immune cells that is killing the tumor, but they're also bulking up the tumor mass, which is why you see an initial increase and then a later decrease. Now this example illustrates one of the caveats of how imaging is currently done, which is we rely predominantly on structural or morphological or anatomical information. We look at shapes and sizes and intensities and volumes, 
and try to get biological relevance out of this. There's no molecular information in any of those images. It doesn't tell us whether a particular tumor specific gene is getting overexpressed or is getting blunted. It doesn't tell us whether an immune cell is infiltrating the tumor or moving away from the tumor. So radiologists, and, uh, and I get to learn a lot of this from my wife. She's a, a maxillofacial radiologist uh, who is currently a resident at UCLA. So a lot of their work is looking at these patterns and coming up with diagnosis that is based on changes in tissue properties and tissue structure, but with very little molecular information to guide them. The only way or the major way in which you can access molecular information in patients clinically is by doing biopsies, which of course is invasive and has uh, serious complications if you have to access tissues like the brain. Another example, a more preclinical example in a basic science scenario is this really interesting experiment that was done by Craig Bennett, who used to be a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara uh, sometime back. I, I think he still uh, lives in Santa Barbara. He's a neuroscientist and he did this experiment in uh, when he was a PhD student, uh, I believe, at Dartmouth. There's a technique in MRI by which you can look at neural activity in the brain. It's a technique that measures how much the blood flow increases or decreases as you're performing an action. That action could be something as simple as tapping your fingers or something more involved like looking at images of uh, different sceneries. And that technique is called functional MRI. It detects that sudden increase, that sudden surge in blood flow and produces signals that tell you what part of your brain is activated in response to what kind of a task. It is also not a molecular technique. It is not looking at any molecular signatures of neural activity. It is not looking at calcium, which is an established integral molecular signature of neural activity. It is not looking at electrical changes. It is not looking at voltage changes. It is only looking at a very indirect and a non-specific and a poorly understood link between blood flow and neural activity. And Greg Bennett did this really interesting experiment which showed that how these kinds of indirect connections can easily be misinterpreted or misrepresented in a scan that does not include molecular information. So he actually took a salmon, a dead salmon, put that in an MRI scanner, and he conducted these images that map neural activity in the brain. And these little red hotspots, these are two different cross sections of the salmon, a sagittal and a coronal cross section, but these little hotspots show pretty strong brain activity in the salmon. Now, obviously the salmon is dead. It was dead many, many hours before the scan was taken. So there's obviously no activity going on here. It just was a beautiful, interesting, and almost you know, hilarious experiment done by Craig Bennett, just to illustrate the point that when you do not have access to molecular level information, you can always, always get information that looks like it is meaningful, but it does not really adequately, truly, or authentically represent the underlying biological activity. So the central question that drives our lab is oh, that, yes, he did indeed uh, win an Ig Nobel Prize. And, and, and you know, it's, it's the, the Ig Nobel Prize and the paper and the poster that he had is available on Google. It was so beautifully, humorously, and hilariously written. Uh, it's something that I always uh, share with my group in my in, in, our, in our group meetings, because it's, it's, it's an example of a beautiful writing style. It's also a beautiful example of how statistics can be used or misused to come up with information when there's actually not. So I also try to use this in the undergraduate statistics course uh, that I teach. But what we kind of drew out from these examples is how can we make biological information or how can we get biological information, meaningful biological information by imaging, but by no longer relying on these non-specific anatomical, morphological, hemodynamic changes, but by trying to connect our images to something happening at the molecular and cellular level in these organisms. And these organisms for us are mostly preclinical animals. So uh, mice and rat models that we work with, uh, definitely not salmons. So what we, the, the way we kind of uh, got interested in this, and I, I was never interested in imaging, nor was I interested in biology. I got my PhD at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and I specifically joined Urbana-Champaign because I was interested in process control, in chemical engineering process control. I was trained as a chemical engineer. I wanted, uh, I was pretty bad with experiments, so I wanted to do, and, and, I, and I loved mathematics, so I wanted to do computational uh, theoretical chemical engineering, and I, I was a particular person I really wanted to work with at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, as it turned out, I uh, and I had just moved from India, uh, and I was used to the tropical climes. I I knew the Midwest gets cold. I'd never knew how cold Midwestern cold is. So there was a fine day in Urbana sometime. I forget in uh, in February probably, uh, 
And I was trying to walk uh, maybe two blocks or three blocks from my chemical engineering building to meet my friend at a cafe. And I was severely underdressed um, for the Urbana weather. And at some point during the walk, it, it was impossible. I, I felt I would collapse even trying to go another hundred meters further. So I snuck into a conference room, uh, partly because it was warm and partly because they had cookies. In India, we didn't get cookies if you attended conferences, here, here you did. And this particular conference had, you know, not the, not the, not, not the typical bagels and donuts. It really had um, a, a pretty good elaborate snacks. And as it turned out, the conference speaker was Roger Chen, who, uh, who passed away sadly a few years back. But Roger Chen won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2008. And in 2009, he was presenting one of the named lectures at Urbana Champaign. At that point, I didn't know who he was. I, I knew he was famous because the room, you know, there was, there was standing space in the room. But Roger Chen was showing these beautiful images of cells that were glowing with different kinds of what looked like molecular torches inside them, fluorescent proteins. They were glowing red and blue and green. And he was talking about how just by looking at these fluorescent proteins inside cells, you can get a lot of molecular and cellular information about what is happening inside them. It really struck me because I was used to physics and chemistry where you make measurements with instruments with, and you, and you have units to the measurements. You have meters, centimeters, newtons, newton per square meters, and you have physical hard instruments that are used for making these measurements. And he was showing soft materials, proteins that he could put inside cells and that could give you information on what gene is being turned on, what protein is bumping into another protein. Are there calcium signals increasing and decreasing inside my cell? Is there voltage that is being turned on inside my cell because of neural activity? And all of that could be assessed simply by looking at how bright or how dim a color is inside the cell. And that is what fundamentally drew me into imaging. I, 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 I still had a passing interest in process control, uh, which I could have did as a side hobby, but I it really got interested in imaging. And uh, it, the, the way imaging started in biology was actually, it, it wasn't Roger Chen uh, uh, who, who's, who started it. He, he took it to different levels. It was started way back in the 1900s, even before that, uh, by um, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who made these really amazing pictures of neurons by staining them with a colloidal silver solution. Till date, the mechanism is not perfectly understood, but Santiago Ramon y Cajal, who is sort of a legend in neuroscience, was the first, one of the first people to really emphasize the idea that we have to be able to look at biology in action to be able to understand biology. And uh, it turned out when these images were first introduced, uh, the scientific community was not excited at all because they were still trying to you know, get to measurements and, and biological uh, assessments in very indirect ways. So this didn't excite them, but this is a kind of uh, staining that is still continued to this day. And to my mind, this underpins a lot of how imaging is done today. And of course, with time, people, biologists started appreciating the importance of imaging a little bit more. So this is another famous experiment done by uh, these two gentlemen where they tried to look at kidney tubules uh, in a, I think it was in a, a pork and a, a pig. And they tried to specifically image these kidney tubules by labeling them with a fluorescent dye that would shine when you kind of uh, illuminate them. And this of course was a very low resolution image. It didn't have as much information in it, but this was another example of using light or using some kind of optical property of biological materials along with these paints, these dyes, to try to get some information out of it. Of course, the amount of information contained in these images is very little. This shows you some branching structure of neurons. This shows you approximately the structure of kidney tubules, but this is still going towards the idea of getting very specific information. A really, really, uh, I would say a paradigm shifting experiment was done by Albert Coombs. <clears throat> Excuse me, none of these images, uh, they, they don't look as cosmetically appealing because the hardware, the technology was not yet developed at that time. But this was an example of bacteria being imaged very specifically in a background, in a complex media. So these were specific antibodies that target bacteria. The antibodies had been labeled with dyes, so the antibodies themselves would glow. And when you mix the bacteria with antibodies and then wash off, everything else, the antibodies and the bacteria that are bound to each other stay together, all else gets removed from the medium. And you can kind of see that. You can take images and you can see antibodies shining because they are bound to the bacterium. And this is another example of trying to get even more specific. So now you are trying to look specifically at bacteria or a specific class of bacteria 
in a sea of many other things, other cells, other proteins, other lipids, by exploiting the specificity of an interaction between an antibody and the surface of the bacterium. So all of these were examples of biologists doing very careful, very innovative, and very, uh, you know, I would say path-breaking experiments to try to look at biology happening in the context of a living system. Now, this underwent a complete paradigm shift with Roger Chen, uh, the Nobel laureate I was speaking about, introducing the idea of genetically expressed fluorescent proteins. So what Roger Chen showed, along with Martin Shalfi and Sami Shimomura, the three gentlemen who discovered the green fluorescent protein, they showed that there's this particular protein found in jellyfishes called the GFP or the green fluorescent protein that you can take out from the jellyfish, you can sequence its gene, and you can insert that gene into any cell, any organism, and that organism starts glowing. It starts producing light. So in this case, these are just cells. These are the cells that would grow on a dish in a lab. And the cells have been genetically engineered to express this green fluorescent protein, and they look green. In this case, this is more than a cell. This is a nematode. It's an earthworm-like, uh, it's, it's a worm. It's a small one, two millimeter worm, C. elegans. And this has been engineered such that certain neurons are fused or attached to genetically, certain neuronal proteins, neuronal genes are attached to this fluorescent protein. And you see this bright focal green spots based on the localization of those uh, neuronal genes being expressed. So the idea behind this was, instead of relying on these dyes that, and paints that are externally added to a cell, you're fusing the code for making this color, this paint genetically inside of an organism. And with that, you get several advantages. And this was the reason why the Nobel Prize was awarded to these three chemists, because the moment you can make something genetic, and and, all, and this is an idea that is uh, that 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 is, is getting even more familiar to all of us now, because uh, all of us who are vaccinated, ho hopefully all of us, we have a, a foreign gene that has been introduced in our body uh, that is helping us uh, fight infections in a, in, a, in a very significant way. So the idea of genetically engineering cells has taken kind of a new dimension now with one of the first examples, with arguably the first example of um, such a large scale introduction of a transgene in the body. But way, way before this, 20, 25 years back, Roger Chen introduced the idea that if you can take a gene that produces light and put that in different organisms and different cells, then you get all the advantages that we dream of as imaging scientists, which is you can look at specific molecules, you can look at calcium signals, you can look at gene expression, you can look at specific cell types, you can look at bacteria separately from immune cells, you can look at cardiac cells separately from the blood vessels that supply these cardiac cells. The imaging can be done for a very long period of time, as long as you can keep the organism or the cells alive, the paint stays with the cell. It does not get diluted because every time the cell multiplies, the gene that is encoding this fluorescent protein also multiplies. The gene is carried over constantly by the cell. So you don't have to worry about replenishing the cell with these molecular dyes every single time, which can be a severe problem uh, depending on the kind of study. It can be an experimental constraint. The other advantage is, as, as most of us probably know by now, is if we have something that can be genetically encoded, it is very easy to deliver instructions for making these, not just in single cells, but inside entire organisms. As again, that goes back to the vaccine example. You know, we have these things injected in our upper arm, which makes uh, these, these, these proteins. And it's an mRNA that gives you the instruction for making that particular protein. So if something is genetic, it's really easy uh, compared with many, many other non-genetic uh, uh, molecules, it's easy to deliver them in living systems. And finally, there's a whole assortment of viruses, and these are not bad viruses. These are viruses that we have engineered so they work for us, that can be used for very specialized kinds of transport within the body. So we, once you have a genetic imaging tool, you can use them in conjunction with viruses for more specialized transport properties. And we won't really get into that, but by specialized, I mean, you can choose viruses that go from the end of your nerve cells, so from the end here towards the body. So it's opposite uh, to the direction of information flow in some sense. Or you can choose viruses that go from here, the body, towards the end of the nerve cells. Even more revolutionary and something that is uh, in clinical trials or will soon be in clinical trials, is there are specific viruses that can cross the blood-brain barrier. This is this impermeable moat, this fortress that blocks molecules injected in our body from reaching the blood. And there have been viruses engineered by a group at Caltech that can carry genes across this blood-brain barrier, and they're being heavily, heavily explored for uh, 
neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's, where genetic treatments could have uh, potential uh, either for uh, in a preventive or a curative way. So once the idea is once we have genetic tools that can emit cells, it opens up a whole spectrum of possibilities. And this has been extensively studied, used, leveraged in the fluorescence world, in the optical world, producing images that not just look beautiful, but that have a lot of biological information that have that has rewritten textbooks. And this is what Roger, the content of Roger Chin's talk was uh, on that kind of chilly Illinois day. What I was left with is, it's amazing that we can look at these fluorescent molecules and fluorescent tools shining in cells and in organisms, but there's a limitation. Light, as we all know, if I shine a laser pointer here, it doesn't come out from the other side. It should not at least come out from the other side of my head. So light does not penetrate thick tissues. Fluorescence works beautifully as long as you're working with cells on a dish. However, as you start scaling up to bigger organisms, mice, rats, macaques, or uh, even humans for that matter, you cannot really rely on these genetically encoded light producing proteins to give you biological information. And the reason is simple, it's because light does not penetrate very deep. It could go to at most perhaps a millimeter, but beyond that light gets absorbed, light gets scattered, and our body has intrinsically kind of light producing compounds that produce autofluorescence, all of which prevent light from being used beyond very superficial structures. But I would argue that there's a lot of biology you can learn by looking at cells on a petri dish, but answers to some of the most fascinating biological questions, you know, how do cancer cells metastasize? How do immune cells find infections and kill them or fail to kill them? How do neurons process information? You know, how with age, with injury, do we lose the ability to process it? Do some people lose the ability to process information in uh, untainted and uncorrupted ways? Answers to questions like this are buried far beyond what can be accessed with light. And to really get to those questions, we need to be able to study biology in conjunction with studying biology on a dish, we need to be able to study biology in model organisms. Um, again, it could be macaques, it could be mice and rats that are reasonably close to humans. But to look, you know, currently all the technologies we have for looking at biology in these model organisms are like that, uh, the, the, the Atlantic salmon and the tumor progression example. They're all anatomical. There are beautiful tools that can let you look deep. There's ultrasound, there's uh, positron emission tomography, PET, and there's our favorite magnetic resonance imaging. And the issue is all these tools, they can let you peer in deep inside an organism, but they don't give you molecular information. So what my lab is most interested in is how do we take these deep tissue imaging modalities and how do we re-engineer them or repurpose them so we can get molecular information out of them just as these light producing proteins have been giving us molecular and cellular information for decades from cells grown on a Petri dish. So in kind of short, our, our basic approach, the way we approach this question or this problem is uh, we rely on genetic technologies. We rely on many different kinds of genetic tools, including viruses, including phages. And we try to use them. We try to repurpose these uh, genetic tools so they can become compatible with tissue penetrant energy forms like magnetic resonance imaging. And then we use them to answer biological questions, usually in collaboration, because most of our work is on the engineering, the biomolecular engineering side, but in collaboration with basic scientists, we try to answer questions that are uh, hidden, that are buried far beyond what can be accessed with optics. And our experimental approach, and, and this is not something that you know, we just thought of out of the blue. You know, we are standing on the shoulders of many, many giants and always you know, like to have their names down here because uh, this is kind of the legacy that we build on. There are uh, many people both in the, a, a lot of groups in the Southern California area, uh, some groups in um, Boston who have, uh, who were, I would say, almost, um, Trail, you could have trailblazed these idea of uh, learning from GFP, but the green fluorescent and protein, but then applying it in the context of these deep tissue imaging modalities to look at biology in ways that were not possible before. And, and these are the people whose, whose works motivated me and continue to motivate our group. So what we, the way we approach this is, you know, GFP is phenomenal because there was this beautiful light producing protein that was almost accidentally found in a jellyfish by Osami Shimomura, one of the three Nobel laureates, while he was out fishing in Japan in 1967. 
And, and that kind of science has become very difficult to do now. Most funding agencies are far too conservative. I will not be able to write a grant to go fishing and, uh, and, and you know, ask for money in the hope that I might find a protein that is interesting. So what we try to do is we try to approach this a, a, a little more uh, rationally in, in, in some sense. We try to look at molecules which have unusual properties, molecules that are found in nature, that are documented in literature. And we try to ask ourselves, can these unusual properties be leveraged in a way to make them visible by MRI? The reason we focus on natural molecules is because then we can encode the instructions for making them genetically. So that gives us all the advantages that genetic tools have. And the reason we focus on unusual properties is because not many molecules moving around us have magnetic properties. So we have to sort of think of creative ways in which we can connect their properties to something that is magnetic. Otherwise you cannot really get a magnetic resonance signal out of them. And, and I'll, I'll, uh, there are three examples and I'll talk about two of those in this current talk, but one example being uh, this first one, which is uh, which will be the first half of my talk. And then the second one was the second half and the third one I'll just allude to it. But just to give an idea of what unusual properties mean from our context is, this is an example of a bacterium called Dinococcus radioturans. It's a bacterium that you can blast with radiation, extremely high amounts of radiation that will completely disassemble its chromosome. And you take the radiation off and give the bacterium a few days and it'll put, it, put its chromosome back in a completely intact way as it was before and it'll survive as if nothing has happened. And there's a lot of studies going on on this bacterium and questions on how does this particular bacterium does such a good job of uh, surviving radiation. And uh, the defense, and, and this bacterium became very, very uh, popular post-Cold War. It was used, or it, 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 there were lots of proposals funded for using this bacterium to clean up radioactive waste. And we found something interesting in this bacterium that I'll talk about in the next few slides that um, helped us connect biological information with magnetic resonance signals. So that's one example of an unusual property, radio resistance, that gave us hints on how to build an MRI tool that is visible inside cells. What is the Another name example. of that bacteria? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, what is the name of that bacteria? It's called Dinococcus radiodurans. So dino as in D-E-I-N-O, and coccus, because its shape is cocci shaped, so it's kind of like a little oval, C-O-C-C-U-S and radio for radiation and durance because it can uh, tolerate radiation. So it's radio durance. It's a super interesting bacterium. The defense has been interested in it for many, many, many years. And some of the peptides that the bacterium makes have been used in mouse models to show that you can borrow tools from this bacterium, put that in living organisms and make them resistant to radiations, at least at the mouse level. So the second example of of again, an unusual property that we got excited by is something called nutritional immunity. We all know we have immune cells in our body that help fight infections. There's a particular kind of immunity called nutritional immunity that is mediated by a certain protein called calprotectin. And uh, the way this protein works is it turns out some pathogens, bacterial pathogens, the ones shown here that, that look sort of evilish, they require metals to survive. They require manganese to survive. And there's free manganese floating around in many of these infection sites that the bacterium uses to survive. So our immune cells have found out a very clever way of competing with bacteria and preventing their survival or minimizing their survival simply by taking away manganese that the bacteria needs. So this is called nutritional immunity. The bacteria wants manganese. These immune cells, these are neutrophils, they release a protein that soak up the manganese from the bacteria's environment and the bacteria can no longer survive because they're out of an essential nutrient. So this is another very interesting phenomenon that happens in some parts of our body, in the gut especially. Uh, in fact, this, this is a process that can get uh, become very dysfunctional if uh, uh, during inflammatory bowel diseases. I learned about this process because my uh, grandmother, who lives in San Jose, uh, has uh, Crohn's disease, and she uh, she had this particular sensing kit that it could use in stool to look for these inflammatory markers. And that's how this idea uh, uh, for connecting it with MRI came about. And I'll get to talk about this a little bit as well. And the final one that I won't talk about as much uh, today, uh, hopefully for some time later, is water diffusion. Uh, there, there are very interesting proteins in the body called aquaporins that they, they work as plumbers. They're molecular plumbers. They help move water back and forth across the cell. And it may be necessary, it, it, is, it has different functions, but in some contexts, it's easy to appreciate what aquaporin does. This protein is found in abundance in the kidneys. It helps fil filter our urine and concentrate it and produce urine at a certain uh, uh, healthy physiological rate. Now it turns out that these proteins, aquaporins, have been 
are being extensively used in uh, space research to actually collect body fluids from astronauts and you know other people in the space station. And then they take a membrane that is encrusted with aquaporins and they put body fluid on one side and they get absolutely pure water on the other side because these aquaporins just by virtue of being biological molecules are absolutely specific. They will transport nothing else but water, not even protons. And we kind of, when we heard, we heard the talk, I heard the talk uh, several years back when I was in Illinois, there was a um, civil engineering seminar that was talking about, environmental engineering seminar that was talking about these membranes. And later when I was at Caltech during my postdoc, it occurred to me that we could connect those two. So this ability of aquaporins to diffuse water back and forth can be connected to magnetic properties that can make any cell that has enough aquaporins in it visible by MRI. And this is a third technique that we are working on to look at gene expression by MRI, to look at neural signaling by MRI, and also to look at proteases, these specific enzymes that get activated in many diseases and cause kind of widespread consequences all the way from cancer metastasis to again, neurodegeneration. I'll focus mostly on example one and a little bit on two, mostly to illustrate kind of our thought process uh, in, in how we go about these problems and also on how some of these tools uh, might be connected to real medically relevant applications. At the core, we don't do any clinical work obviously, but at the core of our work, is uh, can we learn biological information that 10, 15 years from now would help us rethink how we perform, uh, or how we do clinical practice, how we um, uh, think about precision medicine, for instance. So the first one, uh, what do we do with Dinococcus? Why was the bacteria interesting to us? The problem that we were interested in here is how do you image infections. Infections are very hard to image because, uh, and bacterial infections, uh, the same goes for viral infections as well. But again, the way infection imaging is often done, well, clinically imaging is not used as much for diagnosing infections as uh, biopsies and sample collections, all of which are invasive. And very often, um, if there's a suspicion of a bacterial infection, then clinical practice recommends you treat the person with broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, just because uh, that, 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 that works well. Of course, that has other collateral risks, including emergence of antibiotic resistance, which is a huge, huge problem. We might run out of usable antibiotics very soon. Uh, environmental release of antibiotics is also not, not a very good practice for many different reasons. The only kind of clinical molecular level imaging sort of that is done clinically for diagnostic infections is uh, something called um, kind of radio label leukocyte uh, imaging. What, what is done here is we take immune cells from the patient's body and we fill these immune cells with molecules that are radioactive like indium 111 and you inject those immune cells back in the body in the hope that the immune cells will go to the site of the infection and because the immune cells are producing these radiation that can be detected by non-invasive means you can, by localizing the immune cells, get an idea of where the infection is. So this is an example. Uh, this is something that I got from my father-in-law who's an orthopedic surgeon uh, back in India. This is an example of a, of a knee that got infected uh, following surgery. And uh, it wasn't clear what the infection was or the site of the infection. So they basically collected immune cells from the patient's body, WBCs, white blood cells. They filled them up with these indium molecules, put them back into the patient's body. These white blood cells went to the site of the infection and it showed up as this radioactive hotspot in that image. And then you could co-localize this with the X-ray and get an idea of where the infection is approximately in the knee. Now, of course, there are issues with this. You're not really imaging the bacterium directly. You're imaging immune cells that go to the bacterial site. So it is not really specific. And if a patient happens to have infection as well as another pathology like tumors, which is very common, then you won't really get any specific information out of this because these immune cells could very well home to the tumors too, as well as to any other pathologic tissue. So there's a lot of effort in the field to look at bacteria specifically. And this has been done by using uh, certain antibiotics um, and labeling them with these radioactive traces in the hope that you'll be, you'll be able to pull out those bacteria. This is a mouse with an infection somewhere on the shoulder that gets pulled up by this particular molecule. Of course, there's a lot of non-specific background and you see huge signals in the in the uh, stomach and in the bowel region as well. There are also other efforts to make it more specific. This is an example of a mouse with an infection in the thigh muscle, something called myositis. And uh, this particular group at MIT, Angie Belcher, who was also a grad student at UCSB, uh, she's a professor, she's been a professor at MIT for a while now. And she made one of these first tools where, where she developed 
technologies for imaging bacteria very specifically using near infrared light. This is still light based, so it can look slightly deeper than normal visible light, but not as deep as MRI. In general, if you're relying on light to produce uh, images, unfortunately, you are stuck with these kinds of situations. When you, this is actually E. coli inside a mouse gut, and the skin has been completely removed to be able to image those signals, because if the skin and everything was over it, all the light would have been absorbed and scattered. You wouldn't have been able to get anything. So there aren't really very good non-invasive ways to look at bacteria in any vertebrate animal, whether it's mice or humans. And, and we wanted to solve this problem, focusing on at least three properties. One is we wanted tissue penetrant technology, something that could look at any arbitrary depth inside the body. Could be the brain, could be the muscle, but had no depth limitation whatsoever. Second, we wanted to avoid the use of ionizing radiation. So the first two examples that I showed employ positron emission tomography, which has risks. It is not, uh, it, it can be used under certain cases and can give you very good information and very sensitive information, but it has risks, not just for the patient, you know, the, the patient's spouse can also be at risk because when you inject these molecules in a patient and in a person, they don't get cleared out immediately. They stay in the person's body and they keep emitting, depending on the isotope, it can emit different amounts of uh, uh, radiation over a period of time. And it is certainly something one would like to avoid with infants, with children and with pregnant women. So we want to avoid using ionizing radiation if possible, again, none of what I say is to mean that one technology is superior and the other is inferior. So I think all of them have to be used in a complementary fashion because each gives you a certain advantage and has certain trade-offs. So we wanted to make something that is non-ionizing, that is deep tissue penetrant, and that can specifically look at bacteria, not at immune cells, not at cancer tissue, but at look at molecular targets present in the bacterium. So we went to these really nice bacterial viruses called phages, these are, these, are, these are like little, they, they look like you know, noodles. So they're, they're tiny filaments. They're one around, I would say one micron long. And the thickness is very small. The thickness is just maybe 50 to 100 nanometers. So they have a very high aspect ratio. And these are, these, are these are viruses that in fact bacteria, they have no activity against human cells. And they have this big coat that is made with a lot of proteins that they go by different names. So these bluish proteins are called P8, they also have other proteins at the two tips. The beautiful thing about this particular virus is it can be made in very large quantities in a lab or even in a production setting, in a manufacturing setting. They can be made specific to any bacterium that you want simply by changing the composition of the proteins at the head. So if you know what bacteria you want to target, you can accordingly use genetic information to change the composition of these proteins. So the phage now becomes specific for that particular bacterium. In fact, these phages are being heavily, heavily explored for treating bacteria as a non-antibiotic alternative for treating bacteria. There's a whole phage-focused research institute that was set up at UCSD uh, after a very high profile and a widely publicized case when a certain faculty uh, was, I think, out on a trip in Egypt and uh, they came back and they, uh, suck, they, they basically contracted some infection that was not responding to any single antibiotic. And the faculty, the, the, I think both, both the faculty who got infected and his wife, they were both faculty at UCSD. And then ultimately he was treated with phages. There are companies that make uh, these phages and uh, the infection resolved uh, completely after a certain number of doses of these phages. So there's a lot of interest in using these phages as agents that can kill bacterium. We were interested in using phages that can image bacteria. If, if in the process it helps kill the bacteria, that is fine as well. But our initial goal was, can we harness these phages to be able to look at bacteria inside the body the way, and, and by MRI? So what we did was, and as I said, these phages can be super targeted. So these are just transcription um, electron microscopy images. This is a bacterium that is not targeted by the phage. So when you take the bacterium in a tube and mix it with the phage, there's nothing around the bacterium. You don't see these noodle-like phages on the skin, on the surface of the bacterium. If, however, you move to a different bacterial strain and mix it with this cognate phage, you get all these rod-like particles that are stuck on the bacterial surface. This is just to show that phages can be made super, super specific to any bacterium. And in principle, the, the, uh, theoretically, or it's kind of well known just based on sequencing information that for every bacterium that exists in the world that is known, there is a phage or multiple classes of phage that exist that can be targeted to the bacterium. Our human body also contains a lot of phages. It's not very well mapped out, but there's a lot of, there's a huge reservoir of phages that we can borrow from to look at different kinds of bacterium.
what we did was we thought, you know, let's engineer these phages so they become magnetic. So they, in addition to targeting bacteria, they emit magnetic signals that allows us to look at bacteria. And that was our connection with this Dinococcus radiodurans radiotolerant bacteria. It turns out that one of the mechanisms by which this particular bacterium avoids death from radiation, death by radiation, is by using these peptides called DP1. All these you know, biological names tend to be a little more cryptic um, uh, usually. So this DP1 peptide is very good at binding manganese very tightly. And by virtue of binding manganese, it can protect itself from superoxide. So radiation, one of the mechanisms by which radiation damages any cells is by producing lots of reactive oxygen species like superoxides, which are super reactive and can completely obliterate your DNA. Manganese in conjunction with some enzymes can have a role in neutralizing that effect. And one of the mechanisms this bacterium employs is by sequestering large amounts of manganese for itself via this particular peptide, so it can fight off or neutralize or blunt that production of superoxide radicals. We did not want to make the phage radio resistant. Why this became exciting for us is because DP1 binds manganese and manganese is a metal that can be looked at by magnetic resonance imaging. The chemistry is very simple. In, in, in principle, manganese has five unpaired electrons and anything that has unpaired electrons typically produces a magnetic signal that you can look at. So what we did was we took the phage and we genetically manipulated. The beautiful thing, beautiful thing of the phage is it can be genetically manipulated. Its coat can be, you can pretty much do anything that you want with it uh, as far as your imagination goes. So we used all these genetic tools that we already have in our lab that are well established and we manipulated its coat so we could attach this peptide from the radiotolerant bacterium, DP1, all over the phage coat. Once we attached this peptide, now that made the phage capable of binding manganese because this peptide binds manganese and by virtue of having this peptide, the phage binds manganese. So now we were able to load the phage with manganese. And the moment we did that, the phage started producing magnetic resonance signals. In, in, in other words, it became visible by MRI. And, and this little bar graph just quantifies that. The signal in MRI goes by the parlance T1 relaxation. It has, a, it, it has its uh, origins in NMR. NMR and MRI are similar conceptually by physics. And basically what this shows is initially, if you do not have any manganese, you don't get any MRI signals from these phages. As you add manganese, which is bound to the phage code by virtue of this protein, you get a huge increase in MRI signals. Now, of course, we don't want to just image the phage. We want to be able to image bacteria using that phage. So what we did was we showed that you can use this technique to look at very specific bacterial cells. Just to give an idea of the way we do these experiments is we collect bacteria, we put them in a test tube. So this little pellet of cells at the bottom is a collection of bacteria that is, and then we treat that with phage. Then we stick them in our MRI scanner. Uh, interesting stories before I, so there's a very, very nice MRI scanner at Santa Barbara, I would argue one of the nicest in Southern California. And uh, you know, when I was uh, moving here from Caltech in 2018, I was inquiring, you know, what kind of scanners do we have? And um, when I saw the MRI scanner, the person who is the director of the facility, uh, Jerry Hu, I'd asked him, has the scanner been used to image living organisms? Because it was primarily used as an NMR machine for solid state NMR. And he told me the only living organism it had imaged before we started here was an avocado. So this was one of the first examples of a, of a you know, non-plant-based living material that we imaged in the scanner. So these are cells that we collect in these test tubes, and then we take cross sections to the cells by MRI, and we generate images like this. And all that this image, and these are all pseudo-colored, but all that this image shows is if you mix the phages with many different bacteria, then as long as the phage and the bacteria do not have complementarity, as long as the phage cannot bind the bacterium, you don't see a change in signal. So this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa mixed with a phage that does not target Pseudomonas. You don't see a change in signal. Left-hand side is only the bacteria, right-hand side is the bacteria mixed with the phage. This is Escherichia, this is E. coli nissel, a bacterium that lives in our gut. Again, the phage does not target this particular bacterium. You do not see a change in signal. Then we use BL21, another different E. coli strain. The phage doesn't target it. You don't see a change in signal. But when we use ER2738, again, biological names tend to be cryptic, but this is a bacterium that expresses something called a pillus on its surface. And the phage is very good at binding to that pillus. And the moment that happens, the phage, which is now magnetically visible, 
stays associated with the bacteria and you see a sharp change in signal. Of course, MRI is very quantitative, so all of this can be quantified, which is what the bar graph shows here. But this is to illustrate that phage two points. So one is the phage can be made magnetically visible. B, it is very specific for bacteria, even within the species E. coli. It does not detect E. coli nissel, it does not detect E. coli BL21, but it only detects the E. coli species for which the phage has evolved. Now, we were not just interested in detecting E. coli, we also wanted to take it a little bit further and see if we can look at other more pathogenic bacteria. And uh, we chose Vibri Vibrio cholerae. This is the pathogen that causes cholera. Not a big problem here, a huge problem uh, in, 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 in a lot of states in India and other parts of the world. And we did the same experiment in just that in this case, we took the phage and we re-engineered. You remember the tip of the phage that has proteins that you can engineer so it can go and stick to any target bacterium that you have in mind. We re-engineered the phage. So now it has proteins that let it stick to Vibrio cholera, a different bacterium. And we went ahead and for did exactly the same experiment. It doesn't bind with any of the non-target bacteria, but when you mix this cholera-causing bacterium with a phage that has been engineered to bind to the cholera-causing bacterium, it doesn't only uh, detect it, it doesn't only bind to it, but also produces a bright magnetic resonance signal that lets us infer the presence of that particular bacterium. We, of course, this is all in test tubes or in vitro experiments. So we went ahead and tried to do this in, a, in an animal as well. So we had a very simple model. This is the back of a mouse. So it's closer to the hind legs of a mouse. And, uh, and this is kind of how many of these experiments are done in the, in, the, uh, in the imaging community and in the infection field. And we have two infections on the two hind legs. So the left hind leg is injected just with the cholera causing bacterium, nothing else. The right hind leg has the cholera causing bacterium along with the phage that detects that bacterium. And the idea is, uh, you can make out a difference. This is just the cholera causing bacterium, which does not look, it's easy to identify here because we know where it has been injected in a real world context. You would not know where the infection is. You would rely on the MRI to tell you where the infection is. This is proof of principle, but the bacterium by itself does not differ too much from kind of the surrounding tissues uh, of the mouse, the thigh muscles, the, uh, the, the, the fat uh, in the, under the skin, the subcutaneous fat. However, when you mix the bacteria with phages, you get a brightening because the phage is magnetic. And that's what uh, kind of stands out here. And you can do a little more image processing and show that even quantitatively, there's a big difference between the bacterial cells on their own and the bacterial cells that have the phages that make them visible to a radiologist or to the person doing these experiments. So this is uh, one example of how we learn from Dinococcus which has this tremendous capacity to bind manganese to protect itself from radiation. And we took that, again, that unusual phenomenon and installed these on phages with the hope of making our phages very good at imaging bacteria in a very specific way and in a completely non-invasive way. You know, this is a proof of principle experiment, but our future goal is uh, two things. One is we want to increase the sensitivity further. So this is actually a lot of cells. This is, this is more than hundred million cells. We want to be able to look at even fewer numbers of cells corresponding to clinically relevant infection burden, 100,000, maybe even 20,000 cells perhaps. Um, and we also want to detect more realistic infection models. Vibrio cholerae is a bacterium that infects the gut. It starts in the small intestine and then moves further. So we want to be able to look at those kinds of situations. The goal ultimately is, you know, clinical translation is always a dream. It's an ambition, but that's farther, farther down the line. Even before, there's a lot of basic information you can learn about infectious disease mechanisms, about how commensal bacteria live with the host and potentially even aid drug evaluation if we have these techniques that can help us non-invasively and continuously monitor bacteria inside a living organism. So that's example one. The next, I would say about eight minutes or so, uh, I'd, I'd, or maybe at most, maybe nine or 10 minutes, I'll talk about example two, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll take questions, conversations, whatever comes to your uh, mind. So our second example is this idea that I introduced about nutritional immunity, about how certain neutrophils can release molecules that can steal manganese away from a bacterium that wants the manganese and therefore help our body fight that particular pathogen. The reason we found it interesting is from a neural standpoint. You know, one of the biggest, biggest contributions of these 
genetically encoded imaging tools has been the ability to look at calcium. Calcium arguably is one of the, is the single most important iron or, or um, metal iron in the body because it has a strong connection with neural activity. You know, as in when you're thinking, you're listening to my talk, I'm uh, hearing your questions uh, or we are interacting socially, there are different neurons in different parts of the body that are firing. And every time there's electrical activity in neuron, there is an increase in the intracellular calcium levels. And for decades, biologists have used these fluorescent tools that change the brightness in proportion to calcium. So it either turns very bright or dim or even changes color based on how much calcium there is in a cell. And they've used this to map neural connections, to map neural activity inside living systems. And their, their, their revelations, their findings have been pathbreaking. They have led to fundamental discoveries in neuroscience and how we sense emotions and how we sense fear and how neurons degenerate and how um, neurons help process uh, motor function and so on in, in both physiological and pathological states. But because it's light-based, you can't really look at light uh, non-invasively. So if you have light-based calcium imaging tools that are implanted deep in the brain, areas like the hippocampus, like the hypothalamus, which are located very deep, then the only way you can image them is by inserting optical fibers or other kinds of optical lenses physically inside the brain. So it's a very invasive technique that is used for looking at these kinds of calcium signals in animal models. You have all these fibers and uh, endoscopes and lenses sitting in the brain. And even if you keep that invasiveness aside, you're still looking at very small fields of view. So you don't, with light, with microscopy, you can't cover the whole brain, even in a mouse, forget monkeys and other kinds of bigger animals. You cover less than 0.5% of the animal brain. And the brain is one of the most connected organs of our body. It's one of the most connected entities in, in, in the world. It's, it's even more connected than the World Wide Web. Just there's so many signals, so many neural connections from different parts of the brain that are telling the brain how to function. So if you really want to understand the brain, we need to be able to look at large volumes of the brain at once, not just small cross sections. If you look at small cross sections, it's almost like, you know, un understanding or interpreting a Zoom or, or, or a, or a phone conversation by just listening to one side of the phone conversation, not the other side. So we have to be able to look at the network. So what we wanted to do was take an inspiration from these light-based calcium imaging tools that have been around for 30 years now, but develop calcium imaging tools that again can be visible by MRI. And that is what led us to this idea of uh, nutritional immunity. Now these proteins that neutrophils release, as I said, they soak up manganese, but what's interesting about them is that the taking up of manganese does not always happen. It can be triggered. Now, these proteins are present inside neutrophils. You want them to harm bacteria only when they come out of the neutrophils. So inside neutrophils, they're almost in an inactive state. The moment they're released, they suddenly become bacterial foes by virtue of taking up all the manganese. So what's the trigger that switches the protein from a manganese non-binding to a manganese binding state? And it turns out that the trigger is calcium. In our body, there's a lot of calcium in the blood. There's, there's more than 1.8 millimolar calcium in the extracellular environment, not necessarily in the blood, but in the extracellular environment. And it turns out that moment calprotectin, this particular protein is called calprotectin. I should have uh, introduced it earlier. So the name of the protein that does this function, nutritional immunity is called calprotectin. The moment it is released from the neutrophil and it enters this high calcium environment, it immediately switches its structure so it can bind manganese. And that's what this kind of, this is just a quantitative way of showing that using dyes that respond to uh, manganese and calcium in different ways. But the basic idea that we wanted to connect with MRI is this. Manganese, as we know by now, is a protein, is a metal that produces magnetic signals. So if you just have manganese, which is this yellow sphere, and we have these water molecules, which is this H2O blue um, structures. The manganese molecules, because they have five unpaired electrons, can produce magnetic resonance signals just based on the way of how they interact with water molecules. So under this condition, you can you have an MRI visibility. If you were to take this protein, calprotectin, and add this to the solution, what calprotectin does is Normally, if there's, no if there's no manganese, calprotectin would not do anything, it would continue seeing signals. However, if there is calcium, then calprotectin will suddenly change its structure 
So it soaks up all the manganese from water. So just like calprotectin would soak up all the manganese that the pathogen needs, here it takes up all the manganese that is present in aqueous solution and binds it in an environment that is very dry. So that environment where the manganese sits in the protein does not have any water molecules. Now, if you go into MRI physics, all the signals we get in MRI come about because this metal ion manganese is interacting with water molecules. If you can put a shield between manganese and water such that they don't see each other, then you don't get any MRI signal. It's, it's well known and it can be explained based on physics of how spins work. But what calprotectin does, this was our hypothesis, is calprotectin would take away the manganese and you go from an MRI visible to an MRI non-visible state in the presence of calcium. And honestly, in terms of MRI, in terms of practicality of imaging, you don't care whether you're going from on to off or off to on, as long as there's a change and you can pick up that change. So this was our hypothesis. This was what we thought uh, we could use to image calcium signals by MRI, by leveraging the ability of this particular protein to bind manganese in the presence, exclusively in the presence of calcium. We, of course, went ahead and did those experiments. We purified proteins. Uh, we took out this protein from neutrophils. We took out the gene sequence from neutrophils. We put them in bacteria, purified large quantities of the protein, and showed that uh, you can actually, and again, I'll, uh, the, the bar graphs are just a way of quantifying the information on the images, but what we were able to show is you can use different kinds of MRI mechanisms. They go by different names, T1 weighted, T2 weighted, but you can use different kinds of MRI mechanisms to produce contrast using this protein. And that contrast is calcium dependent. In this case, with calcium, you go from a bright image to a dark image. In this case, with calcium, you go from dark image to a bright image. And that is totally up to you, depending on how you adjust the MRI parameters. You have tremendous flexibility. The key thing here is that the protein acts as a molecular sensor for calcium. And that molecular sensor is detectable by MRI. The other important thing, when you're making something that responds to calcium, there's always a worry that it can respond to other metals that look like calcium, like, mag like magnesium, like uh, zinc, other divalent metals. So we also tested it with a kind of host of other metals, and it turns out that it is not responsive to anything else, but definitely not magnesium. The reason we chose magnesium is because it is present in very high quantities in our cells, but this protein does not respond to magnesium. It only interacts with calcium and manganese and uses these two metals to toggle its MRI interactions on and off. And the kind of signal that we can get, the signal change that we can get out of these proteins is in the range of, I would say, 20 to 100 percent, depending on how you're performing your MRI, could be as high as 200 uh, percent if you are um, if you choose your MRI parameters in a certain way. And these numbers are important because in MRI we always struggle with sensitivity. We get very poor signals in MRI, and this this just puts it in the context of other kinds of MRI molecular sensors that have been developed. And what we know from here is at least this particular protein produces larger signals or greater amplitudes of signals than other kinds of MRI sensors for neural function, for neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, and for neural enzymes like kinases that have been developed. This is kind of uh, useful as we start thinking of how to take this enzyme and look at realistic calcium fluctuations in a living animal. We haven't done that yet, but that's where we intend to go towards. And finally, we were kind of... Um, interested. This is a protein. The beautiful thing about proteins is you can always engineer them so you can get more signals out of these proteins. So we did a little bit of protein and that's, that's kind of uh, one thing. Ap apart from the fact that there are a lot of unusual properties in molecules around you, what really excites us is these unusual properties can be made more unusual uh, by engineering those particular proteins. So what we did here was there's, there's a lot, lot is known about the structure of this protein. A lot is known about the biochemistry of this protein from beautiful work by Elizabeth Nolan at the, uh, in the chemistry department. MIT. And we kind of leveraged uh, all her work, a lot of her work, a lot of her ideas to understand how the protein binds manganese, how the protein binds calcium. And we performed some mutagenesis to increase. So we already had this um, X percent signal increase and we performed some protein mutagenesis to further pull that up. So all this shows is that the mutant, which is in that purplish bar, uh, gives us even greater signals than we what got, than what we got with the original unmutated form of the protein. And uh, you could also look at you know, calcium changes that are as low as 10-ish micromolar. The, the, of course, you, know, you get more signal if you look at more calcium, but the reason this particular range is important is because we're interested in physiological applications and we're not looking at calcium in a test tube. So we have to make sure that our agent 
is in resonance with the kind of physiological concentration ranges that we have for different kinds of metals. Now it turns out for calcium, if there's neural activity, as I'm thinking, as you're thinking, then the calcium fluctuations typically are from basal level, which is 0.1 micromolar to one micromolar. That's the typical range of healthy physiological calcium fluctuations. That's not a range that we can detect with our protein because you don't see much of a signal change uh, in that range. However, it turns out that there are conditions like disease uh, that like uh, where there's excess electrical activity in the brain. Epilepsy is one example. Neurodegeneration is another example. Any kind of neural toxicity resulting from uh, infections, uh, tumors can often lead to very high calcium levels more than that 10 micromolar, even more than the 10 micromolar boundary. So what we think is our sensor is tuned uh, to look at calcium fluctuations in this particular range. So this calcium titration curve basically tells us that we have a sensor that may not be perfect for looking at healthy neuronal activity, but that may have the capabilities for looking at aberrant or dysfunctional neural activity that accompanies pathophysiological conditions. And with mutagenesis, we might be able to probably increase to stretch that amplitude even further. And finally, kind of in the last experiment we showed, we did not take this in mice yet because the challenges of imaging calcium in the living brain in vivo in a mouse are pretty significant. So we are kind of working our way towards that now. But before that, we wanted to show that this can be done in mice. So what we did was we took these viruses. These, by the way, are very similar to the viruses that, that have been used for delivering uh, the COVID vaccine in, in some of the, uh, not the Pfizer and the Moderna ones, but the JNJ ones. They were very similar to the viruses that we use in our work. But basically in these viruses, you can pack these particular genes, A8 and A9 are the names of the genes that make this protein, calprotectin, and we can put them in that virus and we can then infect cells with that particular virus. The virus doesn't harm the cells. It only encodes instructions for making that protein inside cells. And as before, we collect the cells in a test tube. We put them in these little uh, phantoms. We, that's what we call them. We can just stick them in our MRI machine. And then when, and this is our MRI machine at Ealing's. And then when we take images, what we see is cells that have been treated so there's an increase in calcium. So these cells have been treated with a compound called ionomycin, which leads to a sudden influx of calcium in the cytoplasm. Ionomycin is a very classic treatment used in the calcium field to produce cells with high calcium loads. Everything else here are control cells that do not have calcium influx in them. They have some basal level calcium, but they have not been treated to kind of experience a surge of calcium. And when we have this situation, and we take MR images, we get a big change only in one case, which is the ionomycin treated cells. And the kind of calcium increases you get with ionomycin are similar to the kind of calcium changes you would experience in case of toxicity or in case of neural injury, as I just said before. So if you have seizures, if you have epilepsy, if there's ischemia, lack of oxygen in the brain, you get these kinds of calcium increases just that now with the technology that we have, with the molecular technology that we have, which is this protein that we can genetically produce inside cells, we can look at these, these, these signals, by the way, are all measured by MRI. And you can always convert them to images, but these are quantitative signals that are measured by MRI. So now with this molecular magnetic resonance tool, we can look at calcium changes happening inside neural cells. So this is in neural cells in actually a hippocampal cell line. And we can sense calcium changes that are commensurate with a lot of pathological neurobiological conditions. And obviously what, what we are taking this now is we are trying to uh, engineer the protein so it can look at not just pathological increases in calcium, but even physiological increases in calcium. So we are not just interested in studying disease mechanisms, but we can also ask basic questions or, or, or we can also give tools so that neuroscientists can ask basic questions like how, how does the brain process emotion? How does the brain coordinate sensory motor function? And, and literally everything in the spectrum of cognition from simple thinking to tasks to addiction, extinction of addiction and so on. So if we can look at calcium at those physiological levels, then we would have a tool that can let us access those questions at any depth and across any volume in the brain. So that's kind of our, our kind of ambitious 50,000 feet vision with this particular technique. So with that, what I'll do is, uh, so these were the two main mechanisms. Uh, and I'll get you a question in, in 30 seconds, and uh, uh, Mary, but these are the two main mechanisms that we are focused on. So with that, I'll uh, conclude, and then I'll uh, take questions, and I'll uh, stop with uh, 
Mary's question as well, but before I, and as I said, there's also a third mechanism that we're interested in, which can be uh, the topic of a talk sometime later, but we do um, a lot of water modulation in cells to also look at other kinds of signals. But what we, uh, what I do want to say is a lot of this work, all of our work, you know, it's been done by my uh, grad, so I do want to make sure that our, our acknowledgement is, uh, uh, does justice to all the beautiful work that has been done by my students. So our lab currently has, uh, we're, we're an interesting mix. Uh, we have students from all fields, chemical engineering, chemistry, biomolecular sciences, marine biology, mechanical engineering, and they pretty much have pushed forward uh, you know, all, all of these uh, experiments, all of this work, and working through very difficult uh, COVID periods with intermittent shutdowns, complete uh, stoppage of research activity, sudden resumptions, and, and so on. So uh, and a huge shout out to all of them who helped push this forward, along with my alumni uh, who graduated last year and have started their individual careers. Our lab also has a lot of undergraduates. We have had uh, undergraduates, I think we have mentored around 30 undergraduates so far. So we have a very strong team of phenomenal UCSB undergraduates from all fields, from pharmacy, from pharmacology, from uh, biological sciences, chemical engineering and chemistry who work with us. And we have an excellent team of collaborators, both at UCSB and outside, who help us connect our questions with basic science question because we build tools and as engineers we sometimes build tools just because we find building the tools exciting we no, don't always uh, think about connecting it with a biological question but it's our, our our kind of our collaborators who help us maintain that uh, connection and uh, finally a shout out to all our funding agencies uh, defense california nanosystems institute nih uh, and the brain and behavior research foundation and just a quick note that ucsb officially has a department of bioengineering now. We never had, a, we were the only UC without a department of bioengineering, uh, thanks to efforts by uh, Dr. Beth Pruitt, who is uh, the director of the department. Uh, we have the department now and we'll be hosting a symposium from August 8th to 10th. It's a three-day symposium that combines industrial visits, industrial um, you know, posters and so on, all, all from the biotech industry and two days of talks from faculty across California. Uh, the, the website and everything will be uh, live soon and I'm, I'm sure all of you know, you'll all receive, there'll be very wide email dissemination, but uh, I think it would be a great conference, a great symposium to attend. So if uh, any of you is interested, if you have time and if you can block off those dates, then I'd be very, very happy uh, to kind of interact with you at the UC wide by This is a symposium that happens every 10 years in different UCs, this year is our turn. And this is the first time we'll be able to showcase our bioengineering department, uh, both to the community and also to the broader um, California bio industry and biotechnology consortium. Great. So with that, uh, I'll stop and I'll start with the questions. So I'll take uh, Mary's question first and then go to you, Robert, if that's uh, fine. Uh, Mary's question is on the chat. So the question here from Mary is, what are we measuring here uh, in this intercellular calcium in living cells or the uptake of manganese or the calcium presence itself? It's an excellent question. It's, it's a, you sound like one of our reviewers. We got a very similar question. We published this paper in ACS sensors, um, uh, I forget, maybe three or four months back. And this was the exact same question we got, or very, very similar question we got from one of our reviewers. The question is, the protein that we have works by, it, it requires two, molecules to make it work. One is manganese and the other is calcium. Yeah. So when we are making measurements, to what extent is our measurement faithfully reflecting what is happening in terms of calcium changes versus what is happening in terms of manganese uptake in cells? It's a very relevant question. In this case, we are almost specifically measuring calcium uptake because we keep the manganese at a saturating level. So the cell is already preloaded with manganese and our basal measurements are made at those under those conditions. So we have a state when there's high manganese, no calcium, and we are measuring the change from high manganese, low calcium to high manganese, high calcium. So okay. that way you can exclude for the manganese, but it's a very good question and a very relevant question when you move to animals, because we don't always have to worry about how do you get manganese yeah. in the right quantities uh, without these kinds of artifacts in animals. And it turns out there's a whole field of MRI called manganese enhanced MRI memory in short that has, taken care of some of these problems. So we are hoping to leverage those lessons when we start thinking about moving to animals. Okay. Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, fascinating talk. Thank you. Um, so I'm just trying to understand what the prospect is for using this. Would this technique effectively give us like a very high resolution fMRI? Is that the idea? 
That is correct. This would be a molecular fMRI because it is looking at calcium rather than blood flow. And it would also give you information from uh, specific cells because, because it is genetic, you can choose that you will look at cells that produce dopamine, dopaminergic cells versus cells that produce serotonin, for instance, serotonergic cells. Or you could choose that you will look only at cells that uh, are, are neuroinhibitory that produce GABA, for instance. So you could combine. So the two differences with fMRI, one is fMRI does not, fMRI probably has some indirect connection with calcium, but it's very indirect through blood flow and so on. This one is more direct. It just, just depends only on calcium and that can have practical implications. So fMRI, for instance, is very difficult to perform in people who have compromised vasculatures, who have tumors, you know, vasculature changes with age, the vasculature changes in different parts of the brain. So the blood flow also changes independent of neural activity that sometimes gets kind of convolved in the fMRI information. So this is more direct, it's looking at calcium. Obviously the most direct would be if you could look at voltage. And I think that's kind of the pie in the sky idea. I just don't know how to look at voltage with MRI yet, uh, but it would look at it more directly. And B is it would also, help you connect the information to specific, well-defined, genetically defined cell types um, in the cell. So just to follow up, so um, is this practical to do in humans or do you have to do genetic manipulation? It, it's a great question. So I think at this point, it is not practical to do this in humans. But you know, one of my uh, one of the people who is listed in that in that uh, subtext in that footnote, who is one of my uh, uh, he was my PhD advisor's advisor and somebody I get motivated by, he once mentioned that there's a certain class of um, patients or a certain group of patients in which these technologies could become a reality in and, and he's also working in similar fields in, in maybe 10, 15 years from now, and that is people who have very um, advanced cases of epilepsy who require surgery. And typically how you do your surgical decision-making in epilepsy is by putting electrodes in the brain, marking out areas of hyperelectrical activity and then operating them out. And that is very indirect, it's very crude because electrodes don't give you that information with high resolution. So this person, his name is Alan Jasanoff, he's a professor at MIT. His idea was if he could use these techniques to map more precisely where this aberrant neuronal activity is going on, then our surgery can probably become more precise as well. And in patients who have such acute epilepsy when it's a life versus death, it's no longer even a quality of life scenario, it's a life versus sudden death scenario, then these technologies could become a reality. So that is something that often, uh, you, know, you know, when when we have like, you know, piles of rejected grants and rejected papers, so that is kind of the thought that helps uh, kind of drive us forward that I think in, in 10, 15 years, it, it may have a very, very relevant medical connection, especially with genetic tools, uh, uh, getting kind of more acceptability in public perception now. Would there be any bad after effects for the patient? I think there could be from manganese usage more than the protein per se, because manganese at very high doses can also lead to toxic effects. We, we all require a little bit of manganese, not too much, but there's, a, there's, there's another group of people, a uh, group of researchers who are actually working on tackling manganese toxicity uh, in, 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 uh, in people who have overexposure to manganese. And they have developed beautiful chelating compounds that you can just inject. And those compounds go to the brain and they just soak up the manganese and they get pulled out. So I think there are ways by which any, I mean, any drug obviously has activity as would any genetic drug to, I would have some collateral, uh, but I think there are ways to um, get rid of that by removing out the manganese. In terms of the protein itself, I actually think this protein is one of the safer ones to use because it is a natural human protein, which means that it is not immunogenic. The human body will not recognize that as a foreign object and mount like a defense response against it, which happens with a lot of other things that we put in our body. But yeah, so that, that's kind of, you know, that is, that is exactly how we kind of go about these problems. And this is what we think about as unusual, these, these functions, because they're, they're not the same as the jellyfish producing light. Uh, they are interesting things that organisms do, that organisms have learned to do over many years of evolution. And uh, we try to think of ways by which can, we can connect this with, again, like, imaging and, and magnetic resonance imaging. Okay. Um, thank you, Mary, and thank you, Barbara. So if there are, and I'm, I'm by the way, I'm, I'm also more than happy if there are questions, follow up, you know, please feel more than welcome, free to email me. Um, I'm, I'm 
pretty much always here at UCSB. So if anybody wants to meet, drop by, stop by a lab, I'm more than happy to meet. I'm more than happy to uh, uh, give you, now, now, that, now we can have visitors uh, on campus, thankfully. So now I'm more than happy to give a tour of our lab as well and, and everything if anybody is uh, interested. But yeah, if there are no more, and thank you all the way, by the way, all for, for all the excellent questions, both during the talk and then afterwards. This was really, really superb. And thank you again, uh, Yvonne, for the presentation, for the invitation and for having me. Well, thank you for so much for the talk. It was uh, fascinating and really thank interesting and, and watch it. And interesting to hear also the August uh, 8th through 10th uh symposium sounds yes, sounds great yeah, i'll and, pass the word and, right and beth will send an official message to uh okay great to, to your group so you mm -hmm. know that because we are still getting trying to get the, the website still looks a little bit unpolished so we're just making it nicer and sure. we'll send out the official message but yeah i think that'll be a great um uh, great avenue for all of us to meet and interact too mm -hmm. yeah great great thank you so thank so you so much much. yeah uh, okay and we'll see people uh next month thank you mary uh Oh, my email. I can just put my put my email down. Oh, sure, sure. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And I hopefully get to meet all of you in person. Uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Great. And hope you can join Thank us. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.